I just wanted to welcome everyone. We're so thankful you're all here today. Um, this is a special Sunday. We have a lot of special things going on, so we wanted to kind of give you a heads up on those things. First of all, it's our quarterly family worship. So all of our kids from Junior Junction and Sunshine Express will be staying in to worship with the church family today. And we do still have nursery available for children who are two and under. And also, Harley and Donna are out of town this weekend visiting family. And so today we have a special guest, Justin Vogel. He and his wife and family have been worshiping with us for a couple of years. He's a chaplain at Fort Sill, and he's going to share a message with us today. So we're looking forward to that. And finally, tonight is Fall Fest. And I just wanted to take the opportunity to personally thank all of you for your support for Fall Fest. It takes a ton of volunteers a ton of donations, and I'm so thankful for you all loving on our community in this way. And also, if you have not made a plan to come to Fall Fest tonight, we would love, I'd love to invite you. No matter what your age is, come, have some fellowship, enjoy a free meal, we'd love to have you. But now my buddy Wyatt here is going to start us off with a scripture as we get ready to worship this morning. And he gave the apostles, prophets, and evangelists, the shepherds and teachers, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, and to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which is equipped when each part is working properly makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Father God, just for today, Help me walk your narrow way. Help me stand when I could fall. Give me the strength to hear your call. May my steps be worship. May my thoughts be praise. May my words bring honor to your name. May my steps be worship, may my thoughts be praise, may my words 
bring honor to your name. Here I am just for today. Live in me, have your way for my desire. When this race is run, is only to hear you say, well done. May my steps be worship, may my thoughts be praise, may my words bring honor to your name. May my steps be worship, may my thoughts be praise, may my words bring honor to your name. May my steps be worship, may my thoughts be praise, may my words bring honor to your name. May my steps be worship, may my thoughts be praise, may my words bring honor to your name. Why do we take communion? To remember Christ our Savior dying on the cross for my sins and for our sins. Two, to proclaim his death. Three, examine our heart. To give thanks, to commune with God and other believers. To acknowledge our conviction with God. And to anticipate his return. My grandson DJ, he gonna read the scripture for the bread. I'm going to be reading out of 1 Corinthians 11, 23, 26. For I have received the Lord, what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. All right, let us pray. Okay. Oh, more gracious heavenly Father, as your son hung on the cross with nails in his hand and feet and the pain he went through just to show how much he loved us, as we take this bread, let us remember the broken body on the cross and that he died for our sin so we could be 
free from sin. Thank you, Father. Amen. Now, let us pray for the blood. Father, as we take this cup that represents your blood poured out on the cross for our sin, I realize that we were, that, that we, I realize that you were the supreme sacrifice for all of our sins, past, present, and future. Because of your blood, we are free from the power of sin if we, if we ask for forgiveness and celebrate the participation gift of life you give us. Thank you, Father, for sending us, your Son, to save us. Amen. This time is set aside for the tithing, but we got the um, chest in the back that you can drop your, your um, visitor cards, your prayers, and if you want to donate, you can drop it off in the back in the chest in the, in the um, foyer. So let's pray for the tithing. <laughs> Father, all blessings come from you, and you just ask for us to give 10%. But if we realize it all belongs to you, and you continue to bless us. We receive from you all the time, like the rain this week, opening our eyes each morning. You give us so much, Father. We pray that these funds given today are used for the upkeep of your kingdom and to spread your word of love in the neighborhood, cities, states, and country and world. We believe um, we are blessed to live in America, free to each week to hear your word. Thank you, Father, for your grace and your love. Amen.
thank you, Lord, for loving me, and thank you, Lord, for blessing me. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole and saving my soul. I want to thank you, Lord, for loving me. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Let us all with one accord sing praises to Christ the Lord. Let us all unite in song to praise Him all day long. I want to thank you, Lord, for loving me. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Please reveal your will for me so I can serve you for eternity. Use my life in every way. Take hold of it today. I want to thank you, Lord, for loving me. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for loving me. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's good to be with you this morning and with our Western Hills family. I want to especially thank Alex for uh, sharing his gift with us, other than having a strong head of hair. He, uh, he has a gift, and thank you for sharing that. And uh, for guys like DJ and Wyatt, you guys are going to be a tough act to follow, but you did a wonderful job. Whenever I see young men get up here, whether it's uncomfortable for them or not, uh, it's great to see, and I know a lot of angels are smiling when they see that. Believe it or not, eventually, uh, once upon a time, I was one of those youngsters. So, uh, you know, who knows? You might be preaching in 20 or, 20 or so years. So I want to thank the elders and Harley for allowing me this opportunity to preach this morning. I would ask that you bear with me. When you're used to a Harley Davidson, a Vespa like me, might be a bit of a bumpier ride. <laughs> now that that low-hanging fruit of a dad joke is out of the way, let's start this journey together. Now, during the course of history, some great things might not have happened had it not been for some unknown, obscure, or even lesser-known person. Columbus's discovery of the New World. In 1491 and 1492, Columbus had been to the rulers of Italy Portugal, and Spain, seeking support for his voyage of discovery. All had turned him down. As he was leaving the castle of King Ferdinand of Spain, after being refused once again, legend has it that a man on horseback raced after him and called him back. The Queen Elizabeth had offered to sell her royal jewels to finance her trip, his trip. Now, we know the rest of the story. During the first winter of Massachusetts Bay Colony at Plymouth, the pilgrims were in very, very bad shape. They had no food. They did not know how to hunt. They seemed doomed. Had it not been for a Native American named Squanto who taught them how to hunt and fish and in the spring raise crops, the pilgrims would never have made it. Acts 11:26. we read of a great milestone in the history of the church. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. Who was this man behind the scenes working to bring about Christ Barnabas? A day where all of our young people are here with us is a perfect day to talk about Barnabas. It allows us to reflect on those who encouraged us, but also reflect on those who got us here today, got us to where we are. Some of us are a little older. We, we have a lot more people that have encouraged us along the way. Some of you are younger, but we still have people that stick out in our minds. But more importantly, I want it to reassess who we personally are currently encouraging and seeking to encourage. Now, all this talk about encouraging brings me back to one of my favorite biblical characters, Barnabas. Today, we'll do a brief study over Barnabas to better understand the man himself and his lasting impact on others and the church around him. 
So what all do we know about Barnabas? Acts 4, 34 through 35, lay the groundwork for Barnabas' first mention in the text. And speaking about the church, there was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of land or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. Now, can you imagine that? Not a single needy person was amongst the church. That's just a powerful thing to think about. Continue, let's, let's go back a little bit. Acts 4, 32. Talking about the same believers. Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. And no one said that any of the things belonged to him was his own. But they had everything in common. What a powerful image of the believers. Now, we're going to go to verse 36, and this is where Barnabas is first mentioned. Thus, Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. So here is what we know. Barnabas was a man who wanted to do what was right. He was an early disciple. He was a man who was very generous. He did more than just make a token contribution one Sunday. No, he sold some real estate and gave every bit of that to the church. Now, he did all these wonderful things, but we, we most know him for being a man who had a special talent, the son of encouragement. The apostles gave him this name. That alone is a testament to him that the apostles thought that highly of him. His name matched his most outstanding quality. What if our name matched our most outstanding quality? What do you think your name would be? I would be son of Steve, I guess. I don't know. A good question might be, how did Barnabas come to have this name? Because he was willing to stand beside others and encourage them as they went about their journey. He was willing to look for those little chances that came along to encourage the brethren. Now we see this because Barnabas stands beside Paul. In Acts 9, after Saul's conversion, we see Paul in Jerusalem trying to join the apostles to disciple there. He was having trouble, however, convincing them of his sincerity. Acts 9 26 says, and when he came to Jerusalem, this is Saul, or I'm sorry, Paul, he attempted to join the disciples and they were all afraid of him for they did not believe that he was a disciple. Now that's hardly a small wonder considering his past. You can't blame the disciples in Jerusalem. Saul, I am sure, had quite the reputation amongst Christians and not in a good way. I'm reminded of Acts 9.1. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogue at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now, on his way to Damascus, we know what happens to Saul. But the church in Jerusalem does not. They do not know about his conversion, his seeing Jesus. The disciples in Jerusalem, they have the recent memory of Saul in Acts 8.1 approving of Stephen's execution. It's like if the school bully who constantly picked on you, tormented you, came up to you the very next day and said, let's be best friends. Obviously, you would be apprehensive because you have reason to be apprehensive. There was a great need for someone to bring Paul and the disciples together. That someone was Barnabas. Acts 9.27 tells us, But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord, who spoke to him, and now at Damascus he preached boldly in the name of Jesus. This is a testament once again to Barnabas's reputation. He vouches for the notorious Saul, newly Paul, and people listened. 
not just any people, the apostles listened to what he had to say. Now, what's the result? Obviously, open the New Testament and odds are you're going to find a book written by Paul. Paul preached boldly in the name of Jesus in Jerusalem and he went on to do great work for the Lord. Barnabas also stands beside John Mark. In Acts 13, we see John Mark on the first missionary journey with Paul and Barnabas. But Acts 13.13 13 tells us that he turns back and goes home at Pamphylia. Now when Paul and Barnabas are ready to go on a second missionary journey, Barnabas wants to take John Mark with them. But Paul refuses. Acts 15.36 tells us, And after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, Let us return and visit the brothers in every city where we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Now Barnabas wanted to take with them John called Mark. But Paul thought best not to take with them one who had withdrawn from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to do the work. And there arose a sharp disagreement, so they separated from each other. Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus. You see, Paul held a grudge against Mark for leaving them early last time. But he was not soon to forget that. Paul had a fool me once, shame on you mindset. Paul was done with him because of what happened in the past and because he was so focused on the missionary journey at hand, he only wanted reliability in that moment. Barnabas, however, stood by John Mark and I'm sure lived up to his namesake and encouraged him at every turn. Standing by him, and standing up for him to a guy like Paul, I'm sure would be encouragement enough. So what was the result of Barnabas's encouragement of John Mark? Well, he goes on to write the book, The Gospel of Mark. Even Paul later recognized Mark's usefulness. 2 Timothy 4.11 has Paul saying, Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is very useful to me for ministry. Mark had come full circle in the eyes of Paul, and there is little doubt that Barnabas' encouragement played a role because he saw great potential in him. Now, I want everybody to stop and think. Think about those who acted as per personal Barnabases in your own life. Who knows where I would be without my personal Barnabases or someone willing to stand beside me and encourage me? One such individual that stands out to me I was 12 years old. Uh, I was firmly entrenched into an awkward phase that I'm hoping that will end soon. And I had just been baptized, and, and I, this is a, a PC world, uh, not what you're thinking, pre-COVID. Uh, so we, we, we did communion with the trays and everything. Uh, so I get asked to do it. So like a young man would do, I decided that I was going to practice. I practiced all the time at home. I was preparing myself for every situation. The Lord came back, I was prepared. So day of comes, the bread happens. I don't want to brag, but I crushed it. Uh, my, my section was right here. The, the, the auditorium was, was uh, like this, right here. I uh, get back to do the juice. I, I get down, and as they say, bow your heads to pray. As I am closing my eyes, I notice that every tray, I have all the cups, but no juice. I lift, you know, I'm, I'm trying to be casual, so I, I casually lift the second tray, no juice. I look to my left and right, they all have juice. I'm kind of like, is this a test, Lord? So I'm panicking. I'm, I'm like, I had prepared myself for every situation. I don't know what to do. I, I'm just, you know, longest prayer of my entire life. They say amen, everyone goes to their designated areas, uh, except me because I had not prepared for that, I stood there frozen. This, like, mind, like I said, mind you, I had literally, I was still wet from baptism. And this is my first leadership opportunity, and I'm standing there frozen. Uh, one of the deacons, Joel Thompson, he kind of kind of just thinks I'm frozen and that I just got nervous. And he's like, come to me, come to me. And I'm like... <laughs> and he gets up, sees what the issue is, grabs another tray from somebody else, Everything goes off without a hitch. In the moment, I, I was so embarrassed. 
I, I, I'd failed. I, I was given one responsibility, and I, and I just, I just, I failed. He came up to me afterwards, and he insisted, you did, it wasn't even noticeable. You did so great, like, oh my goodness. And as I've aged, I look back and see that I did not handle it well. But in that moment, I needed to hear that. Because guess what? I got asked again, and I said yes. Because of his encouragement in that moment, I was willing and able to get up there proudly and do it again. And I had juice the second time. So Barnabas further encourages the local church. So beyond encouraging specific individuals, Barnabas encouraged local church bodies. So Acts 11.19 picks up from where Acts 8.4 leaves off. Now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose after Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who were coming to Antioch. To sp- Antioch spoke to the Hellenist also, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them. And a great number who believed turned to the Lord. So the conversion of the Greeks caused some concern for the church in Jerusalem. Acts 11, 22. The report of this came to the ears of the church of Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. So this concerning issue arises, and who does the church in Jerusalem send? They send Barnabas. Acts 11, 23. When he came and saw the grace of God, now this is Barnabas, he was glad and he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And a great many people were added to the Lord. So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. For a whole year they met with the church and taught a great many people. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. So how did Barnabas stand beside the church at Antioch and show all of his noteworthy traits? Well, first, he was not envious of the success of others. Verse 23 tells us that he, in fact, was glad. Next, he became involved by using the gift that God gave him. 23 also tells us that he exhorted them. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't use the word exhort very often. So I had to use the Google machine and look it up. Exhort means strongly encourage or urge someone to do something. He used his gift of encouragement to help the church body grow. Ephesians 4, 11 through 16 gives us a short breakdown of how the church was designed by the Lord. And now as Wyatt master, masterfully read for us, I want to read it once again. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip for the, the saints for the work of ministry, for a building up of the body of Christ until we all attain the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Barnabas's gift was encouragement. Now that is valuable with young Christians, which helps them not to be tossed to and fro by the waves, as Ephesians 4.14 tells us. So Barnabas also encouraged all of them, not just a single particular group, not the Jews, not just the Greeks, all of them. What better way to speak the truth in love than to encourage every person around him? Love every person around him. No better way to help the church body. 
Barnabas also encouraged faith and commitment to God. The end of verse 23 finishes by saying that Barnabas exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. Not faith to him, not faith to Jerusalem, but faith to God. Faith in anyone or anything except God is false faith. He practiced what he preached. Acts 11.24 says, For he, Barnabas, was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and a great many people were added to the Lord. Have you ever tried to explain to a child how to ride a bike? No matter how well you describe it, the best way to teach them is through by using an example, showing them. You want to change the community that you're a part of? Model that change. Demonstrate it in your daily life. So what's the result of Barnabas' lifestyle model? The end of 24 tells us that a great many people were added to the Lord. Now it doesn't stop there. Barnabas also got others involved. Verses 11 I'm sorry, chapter 11, verses 25 through 26. So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. The mark of a good leader is is the ability to delegate. That means not do the work of 10 men, but rather the ability to convince and encourage 10 men to do the work. Little doubt exists that This time provided invaluable experience for Paul during the infancy of his ministry. Verse 26 also tells us that uh, Barnabas had patience. For a whole year, they met with the church and taught a great many people. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. He and Paul preached there for a whole year. They did not preach there and move on to the next spot. They invested a year in that area. They modeled change while practicing patience with that area. Now, patience is required for many things. For crops, gardening, being an OU fan, (laughs) sports, Christianity, but especially evangelism. We need to develop patience for others but we especially need to develop patience for ourselves. Despite all of these wonderful traits, Barnabas was content to work behind the scenes. Now, we do not have a single recorded word that Barnabas speaks in the entire text. He was content to work beside Paul and even in the shadow of Paul for the betterment of the church. Now, Barnabas did great things for the church. He used his God-given gifts, most notably encouragement, to further the kingdom of God as well as the gospel. Now, regardless of which biblical figure you resonate with most, I think Barnabas is a worthy example that we should continually strive to emulate. Barnabas models a life of encouragement for every Christian, man and woman alike. Paul needed Barnabas to vouch for him, minister to him, encourage him, and love him. The church will never have a shortage of people who want to be Paul. After all, Paul did do wonderful things for the church. Paul is a wonderful biblical figure to emulate. However, Paul was so focused on evangelizing and fulfilling his own calling that he wrote off Mark completely. We as a church sometimes get too wrapped up in our overall mission, like Paul. We strive to be as meaningful as Paul was and important to the church as Paul was. However, too often we get so caught up in trying to be Paul that we miss the little but exceedingly meaningful opportunities to be Barnabas. I want to read that once again. Too often We get so caught up in trying to be Paul that we miss the little but exceedingly meaningful opportunities to be Barnabas. We miss opportunities to encourage our brothers and sisters in Christ, 
to build them up. We often even use serving Christ as an excuse for missing those opportunities. It has been 22 years, and I can tell you the name of a man who acted as a personal Barnabas to me at the age of 12. That one small act of encouragement helped mold me into the Christian man that I am today with that small encouraging word. Are you willing to be someone's Barnabas? Are you seeking opportunities to encourage those you come into contact with? Or are you so focused on your own mission that you let it fall by the wayside? Are you writing people off like Paul did to John Mark because they messed up or came up a little short of your own expectations? Or are you willing to pull them aside and help them to get back on their feet and become more and more confident in their own God-given abilities and talents that they grow in knowledge and in wisdom that allows them to do great things for the church. The church will always need people who want to emulate Paul. But I would gladly argue that the church needs people to emulate Barnabas even more. Paul would not have even been able to reach his own potential without the influence and the encouragement that Barnabas brought to the table. These young children in the room today with us need encouragement every single step of their spiritual journey. I am a 34-year-old man, and I need to be encouraged from time to time. It is meaningful and oftentimes reminds me why I pursue the calling that God has called me to. Again, think of those that encouraged you in your own spiritual journey and how meaningful their encouragement has been in your own life. Even an intellectual and a self-confident man like Paul, read the text, he is, needed encouragement to continue running his race. I leave you with this charge put forth by the man who was on the receiving end of Barnabas' encouragement and obviously saw why it was so important for the church. 1 Thessalonians 5.11 has Paul writing, Encourage one another and build one another up. Now whenever we gather together, I want to offer an invitation. Maybe you are personally in need of encouragement or you need someone to pray with you. Maybe you have been encouraged to be baptized. Whether you respond privately or publicly, I would invite you to do so as we now stand and as we sing.
thank you card and a minimum of announcements and uh, then we'll have a closing prayer and uh, scripture. We have a thank you from, uh, from Angie and she writes this note, I wanted to say thanks again to all the men that came to help me move my furniture into storage. I'm forever grateful. God bless each and every one of you and uh, that's a note to all of you who helped her move. And that includes Jeff, Jeff, Brad, Mac, Lane, Mitchell, Roger, and Justin. And uh, I know that was an encouragement for Angie. Thank you all for helping. And uh, then please check the announcements on the order of worship on the back side. There's a lot going on starting this evening with uh, Fall Fest and uh, throughout the rest of this week. So uh, please uh, take a look at that and make sure you're up to speed and don't miss any of these opportunities to fellowship. And then I want to thank Justin. It was an encouragement for me, his message this morning, and a reminder of uh, so many people in my life, and I hope in yours, that have been encouragements in our Christian walk and uh, sometimes just walking down the street. We all, need a, we all need a bump and encouragement. There were several other things that were encouraging to me today. In case you all missed it, one of them was Alex Rodriguez. Thank you, you were an encouragement. It's good to see you up here. Another one was Janice and Wyatt, who uh, got us started this morning with a, welcoming, with a welcome and a verse. And Mac and DJ, you're an encouragement. It's good to see you up here together helping us get through and go through our communion. And uh, again, Justin, thank you for your message. Uh, it's really a, an encouragement to see these young people up and uh, out in front and getting involved. And then my last comment would be an encouragement for each of you all to be encouragers this week. Let's uh, stand and we'll have our closing scripture and closing prayer. Please join me. Direct my footsteps according to your word. Let no sin rule over me. Let's pray. God, as we go through this week, we thank you for the encouragers that you send into our lives, for those that uh, brighten days that aren't so bright, and for those that make bright days even brighter. God, uh, thank you for sending your messengers into li your, our lives, and please help us be your messengers in the lives of others, that we might be encouragers and strengthen, uh, be a source of strength to those who are seeking you. God, we love you. We thank you for the fellowship we share in this place, and we just thank you for sending your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, in his name. Amen. Have a blessed week.